my trusty Apple Watch says it's officially afternoon. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Megan Collette. I am a behavioral health consultant with the um, MOC and open team at Michigan Medicine. And we are super glad that you are all spending your next hour with us um, and Dr. Mankey um, with Novel Psychoactive Substances of 2023. We are um, grateful to have him here to present with us. Um, on our screen, you will find the QR code and some other information with eeps.com. Um, for any CE credits that folks would like for today, we will also be putting a PDF um, throughout the um, presentation today into the chat function, um, sharing all of the um, information that you might need, um, remembering that um, these um, activity codes do expire. Um, and so to please um, take heed to that um, if you are hoping to collect um, those credits from our presentation today. Um, again, my name is Megan Collette. I'm in the Michigan Opioid Collaborative and OPEN with Michigan Medicine. Um, we welcome you today to our webinar um, this afternoon. Um, just a few um, other housekeeping items. Please make sure that you're um, muted throughout the presentation. We are also implementing our Q&A function. Um, so we'll hear a lot of great material today. Um, and we would encourage you to please use the Q&A um, a function for those questions so we can make sure that they get answered. Um, if we don't have time today, then um, we will be sharing those questions um, with um, our presenter later um, for um, other resources that we could send out um, afterwards if we run out of time. Um, our chat function today, if you could please use that chat function to share your name, organization, and email with us um, just for attendance purposes and to be able to share all of our resources um, that do um, come in today for our presentation. Um, we're super excited to have you all join us um, and welcome. Um, I'm going to share a brief overview of the Michigan Opioid Collaborative. Um, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative is an interdisciplinary team that supports providers and communities to increase access to office-based addiction treatment, expand care, and improve quality of care with patients with opioid and other substance use disorders throughout Michigan. MLC is grant funded through Blue Cross Blue Shield and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We offer free same-day consultation services to help provide evidence-based quality addiction treatment. Our team of specialists are available to help with patient case questions related to treatment and management of substance use disorders. MOC also orders quarterly introduction to buprenorphine trainings. We have one scheduled for December, and as well as webinars such as this on various educational topics, um, such as addiction, stigma, and other substance use topics. We also have a hepatologist on our team who offers hep C consultations, facilitates a biweekly case consultation webinar, and has developed a three-part webinar series on HCV treatment. The Michigan Opioid Collaborative has a wonderful website, and we hope you will all would take a moment to take a look at that. We have created toolkits for our providers and have many more resources with um, when treating patients with FCD um, on our website. The Michigan Opioid Collaborative has three behavior health consultants stationed around the state, and we're happy to help facilitate trainings for your organization, answer other questions you may have, troubleshoot technical assistance, and be an extra support to you and your organization and your community. Again, please take a moment to take a look at our website um, for other events that we have um, coming up the, toward the end of this year and beginning in 2024, which is fun to say, 2024, we're almost there. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing and introduce our speaker today. Um, Nathan Minky, MD, PhD, is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Michigan Medical School. He attained his medical degree from the Ohio State University School of Medicine and his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from Virginia Commonwealth University. He completed an emergency medicine residency at the Medical College of Virginia, followed by a fellowship in medical toxicology at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He is a board certified in addiction medicine, emergency medicine, and medical toxicology. Dr. Menke joined the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan in 2021 and is the current medical director of the addiction consult team. We are so grateful for um, him to be with us. Um, and I will turn it over to you um, as soon as you are ready. All right, so I'm giving a talk about novel psychoactive substances of 2023. 
So what we'll be covering is what are the emergent psychoactive substances? How can we use clinical clues to identify intoxication from these substances? And what are the clinical challenges associated with these, these substances? And so what is a novel psychoactive substance? So it's any natural or synthetic substance that's not controlled by the 1971 Convention on Psychotrop Psychotropic Substances. Typically, these substances pose a health threat to the, to the patient population. And when we say novel, we mean availability rather than invention. So a lot of these chemicals and substances are very old, uh, but they have just recently become more popular. And so this is a problem worldwide. And so the UN has been keeping statistics on this. And so in like 2008 or 2007, the total number of, of these substances was like 40. And so we've sent, seen a significant increase. And the, they're kind of split up in different categories. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And again, this is a global problem. This isn't a problem just in the United States. These substances are everywhere. And so typically these are legal to possess, right? And so they're designed to replace banned or controlled drugs. And so if one of these substances does become scheduled, then another compound is marketed in its place. And then it's called the legal alternative to it. And the way they make them legal is they're sold as bath salts, plant food, insecticides, novelty items, chicken feed, additives, incense, supplements, or research chemicals. And it'll say right on the, the product container, not approved for human consumption to make sure you're clear to the legal authorities that this is not being sold for human consumption, even though it is, and everyone knows it is. And so because they're not regulated by the FDA, they're typically synthesized in underground labs. So there's no quality control. There's been lots of issues with contaminating agents with these products. And so when you talk about federal regulations of substances, you kind of talk about the Controlled Substance Act 1986, the Federal Analog Act, right? Because, you know, if you take fentanyl and then you add a fluoride molecule to it, it is no longer fentanyl. And so in order to make every substance in that kind of category legal, they had to make it kind of general that any chemical similar to a Schedule One substance when intended for human consumption to try and prevent these, these place, people from being able to market these substances. And then once they're illegal, just add a fluoride or chloride or whatever, um, substitute the molecule. And then in 2012, the Synthetic Drug Abuse Prevention Act, um, they're designed to try and get these synthetic drugs on the Schedule One list to make them illegal. And so why do patients use these, right? Well, number one, they're legal, right? You can go to your local gas station and buy the stuff. You can go to your, your head shops or wherever you want to purchase them. A, a large majority of them evade drug testing. So if you're on parole or you work in the military, you're going to get drug tested. Um, so if you want to avoid potential issues, you can use some of these substances that are not able to be tested. Again, they're easy to purchase. These days, quite often, you can just go on the internet and buy them. And oftentimes, they're pretty cheap because, again, they're just, they're just chemicals synthesized in a lab. And so the main classes that we talk about are the stimulants, sedatives, opioids, hallucinogens, and cannabinoids. And so when we talk about stimulants, we talk about CNS stimulants, right? They affect the, we like to call them biogenic amines or dopamine, norepi, and serotonin. And the classic classes of this are the phenylethylamines, the cathinones, the piperazines. And so they can have a, a kind of a range of effects on people. So they can be pure stimulants, kind of like amphetamine, or they can be more along the hallucinogenic or empathogens. Uh, so empathogen, a good example of that is, is ecstasy. Um, and then these, again, these chemicals are designed to mimic the effects of cocaine, amphetamine, meth, and, and ecstasy. But again, they're legal, so people can, can buy them without consequences, legal consequences. Again, sedative hypnotics, they're just CNS depressants. They lower neurotransmission levels or reduce arousal, and there's lots of different mechanisms by which they do that. The most common probably are the synthetic uh, uh, benzodiazepines. Uh, we see a lot of the Edizolam um, uh, or whatever 
benzo they're purchasing on the internet again they're designed to effect to mimic the effects of drugs like diazepam valium lorazepam ativan clonazepam clonopin and alprazolam or xanax opioids obviously these are medications that activate opioid receptors so the one kind of most i guess the one that's becoming more and more popular is the kratom again i went to my local gas station the other day and there were like three shelves full of different kratom products the fentanyls we're all aware of the fentanyl overdose epidemic uh nidazines are kind of one of the new new ones that are out there and again this is designed to affect mimic the effects of opiates like heroin or opioids like heroin or opiates like morphine or or opiates like heroin or demerol or dilaudid then hallucinogens slash disassociatives kind of i lump those kind of together the hallucinogens typically activate serotonin receptors um the main classes of the tryptamines and the lysergamides so designed to affect mimic the effects of psilocybin lsd dmt and the dissociatives are classic nmda receptor antagonists so it produces feeling of detachment and dissociation it mimics the effects of pcp and ketamine and then cannabinoids obviously again there's a, kind of like opioids except they activate the cannabinoid receptor instead of the opioid receptor there's a bunch of different classes these medications and these are designed to mimic the effects of delta 9 thc right the main psych psychoactive substance in cannabis and so these used to be a lot more popular 10 or 15 years ago when when cannabis was illegal in most places but now that it's legal to purchase in many more states the the popularity of these substances have decreased significantly and so clinically these offer many challenges Right. So a person may purchase a product and that may be all they know. Right. They just have a name and there's you have no idea what's in that product. And then drug screening doesn't work because, again, most of these substances are not designed to be tested on our, our current panel of tests. And so even if you were to know what the chemical was, these aren't these aren't tested for human consumption, right? So we don't know the clinical effects, we don't know the potential toxicities, nor the addictive potential of these products. And we also know that there have been lots of bad clinical outcomes from these, including death and permanent disability. And so I got a request for to cover these these topics for this for this lecture. And the ones on the left, I kind of don't consider novel psychoactive substances. The fentanyls, they aren't really novel. Like we've been seeing fentanyl for 10 years, crack, cocaine, um, cannabis, heroin, MDMA, methamphetamine. These are all common substances that, that don't meet criteria. Ketamine is a controlled substance. Again, it's not really a novel psychoactive substance because again, it's been around forever and used recreationally for quite a long time. And same thing with the psilocybin or the, the psychedelic mushrooms. So the ones that did meet the criteria are the synthetic cannabinoids. I got a request for any of the synthetic drugs that are available at gas stations. Again, we, I talked about why they're legal there. Uh, NN dimethylpentalone, which is a synthetic cathinone, hallucinogens, xylazine, and kratom. And so I tried to cover as many of these as I could. You know, I had to pretty much stop once I reached 88 slides because I could I could talk about this stuff all day but I only have a limited time for this lecture. And so I tried to focus on ones that you're more likely to see. So case one is this 37 year old male who was injecting about one gram of Trank every day. He injects into both his hands and legs. He presented with non-healing wounds on his bilateral lower extremities extending from the knees to ankles, associated with copious purion drainage and foul smell. And so this is classically xylazine. Um, discovered in 1962 again novel doesn't mean when it was discovered novel means more when it's been coming to to being used by people uh discovered as an antihypertensive agent it is fda approved as a common veterinary tranquilizer but it is not a controlled substance and it is definitely not reversed by naloxone so how does it work it's an agonist of the central alpha 2 adrenergic receptor and so this would put it in the sedative hypnotic class it causes sedation analgesia euphoria and then it causes significant cardiovascular effects 
decreased peripheral vascular resistance, decreased heart rate, and decreased blood pressure. This class of medication oftentimes is used to mitigate opioid withdrawal, right? Clonidine, which is another agonist, central alpha-2 agonist, or dexmedetomidine may be used for opioid withdrawal symptoms. And it may blunt the response to hypoxia. And so just to warn you, there are some graphic slides in this, this case. So just be prepared if, you're, if you don't want to, to see graphic wounds. So just look away. Uh, so pharmacokinetics, time to effect one to two minutes, time to drug effect peaks at 30 minutes, duration effect up to four hours. From veterinary data, it's thought to be synergistic with opioids. And so that's why they think it, it has been added to the, to the drug supply, that it improves euphoria, prolongs the duration of fentanyl. And so if you look at this graph, you can see in 2015, there weren't many places that were seeing any xylazine, right? Outside of like um, Philadelphia and maybe San Diego, just no one was seeing it. But there has been a, a significant increase pretty much across the country in the, in the prevalence of this substance. And so before we start talking about the wounds, when you're talking about a xylazine overdose, typically it's a combination of xylazine and fentanyl. So usually what you see is a classic opioid overdose, right? The the classic toxicology triad is is meiotic or small pupils, decreased respiratory rate, and altered mental status. And so what typically would happen was you'd give these patients Narcan and they wouldn't wake up, right? Because Narcan is not going to reverse the effects of a central alpha-2 agonist. And there's debate about whether the xylazine is protective as far as overdose deaths or makes it worse. And, and a lot of the people in Philadelphia says people are less likely to die. And the thought being, if you replace any amount of fentanyl with xylazine, it's a lot safer. So even though there may be some synergistic effects between the two, xylazine is safer than fentanyl as far as respiratory depression and death. And so one of the major parts about xylazine are the wounds. I am sure most of you have heard about these terrible wounds that they're seeing in Philadelphia. Uh, they can start as purple red blisters, can progress to areas of necrosis with a thick HR. And the interesting part is it can be at missed injection sites, it can be at non-injection sites, and it can be whether they inject or not. So it doesn't matter if they're taking it, if they're taking the fentanyl PO or insufflating it versus injection, you can still see the wounds. Uh, it can appear to local vasculitis, um, and then these wounds will continue to worsen if they continue to use these medications. And typically, if they're injecting fentanyl, they're not taking care of their wounds. So the wounds are just going to keep getting worse. That can lead to chronic osteo or gangrene. And so see, here are some of the wounds. Um, and so the first place in the United States that this was actually seen was in Puerto Rico, and that's where these, these pictures come from. Uh, these are some of the cases from, this is that they saw in Connecticut. Um, so 1A, 1B, and 1C is kind of a, a progression of the wounds with wound care. Um, then the 2A and 2B are progression when they kept using. And then C is after they've gotten wound care. And again, 3A and 3B are continued use, right? And you can just see how terrible these wounds are and, and how challenging they are for, for patients that are using these substances. Again, this is just another example of these, these wounds. So how do we manage these wounds? So you want to avoid alcohol and hydrogen peroxide, right? You don't want to do more tissue damage. You want to make sure the wounds are clean, soap and water or saline. Keep the skin around the wound clean and of drainage and moisturized, right? You don't want this wound to extend. And you can use vitamin A and D ointment. And the goal is to keep the wound bed moist because of all the dead skin and the eschar. If it progresses to the black hardened wounds, like we saw in a couple of those cases, you need to do some kind of debridement. You can use chemical debridement using collagenase ointment. You can use the autolytic honey dressings, or you can do mechanical, right? You can cut out cut it out, or you can use wet to dry drip dressings that'll kind of rip the, the, the tissue off. And so xylazine can technically be detected in serum and urine. Uh, typically you need something like GCMS, 
the turnaround time for most places is a week. Um, you need to use something like GCMS or LCMS. But there are some test strips uh, that are available that you can use to test your, your product before injecting it to see if it does have xylazine in it. And at the University of Michigan, we have seen, I don't know, maybe double digit cases over the past year or two. So we're not seeing that much. And we really haven't seen any bad cases of xylazine wounds. We've seen lots of, of terrible wounds from injection use of injection substances, but not that we can specifically say is from xylazine. So case two is a 64, five-year-old male with history of uh, opioid dependence and chronic pain, neck, shoulders, back, bilateral upper legs. His pain began after a helicopter crash while in the armed forces in the 70s. He was started on opioids for pain management at that time. He's had multiple other injuries and surgeries since that time. And his last prescription was months ago, but it was discontinued due to a pain contract violation. And again, that's a very common thing that happens to patients that are on chronic opioids. So he, he tells us he's started taking six capsules of a pain medicine that he obtains from his local gas station. He denies ever having significant withdrawal from opioids, but he did mention that he will titrate the medication based on if he develops loose stools, right? Which is obviously a concerning symptom for potential opioid withdrawal. And so what do you think this is, right? Gas station, pain medication. So this is classically Kratom. So this is a legal plant problem product, right? This is considered a herbal supplement. So it is not regulated by the FDA. It's de de derived from uh, a, a tree in Southeast Asia, uh, Mitrogynia speciosa. It's a evergreen in the coffee family. And classically, people talk about it has unusual dual properties where at low doses, it's a stimulant and at high doses, it's a sedative analgesic. But, you know, if you talk to patients who use opioids, a lot of the, these patients say that they get stimulation from the opioids, including buprenorphine. You know, that, that that's the reason they take the oxycodones. It gives them energy and it allows them to get stuff done. Uh, a lot of patients don't want to take buprenorphine at night because it'll keep them awake because they're so stimulated. So I suspect it's not a true stimulant and you're just getting this, this type of opioid stimulation that some patients do get from, from opioids. You can purchase it as a powder, as leaves, gum. People take it in capsules. They make tea, you know, and they use it to treat their chronic pain, right? If they're, if, if they think opioids will help and their physician isn't willing to, to write them opioids, they can purchase this themselves over the counter at, at the gas station. Some people want an all natural way to get off opioids, right? And Kratom's from a plant, so it's all natural. And they, you can use it to treat opioid withdrawal sy symptoms. Other people use it to treat fatigue, to improve their energy or mood, to or just because it makes them feel good. And the main psychoactive active component is the mitrogynine. Um, it's more potent than morphine. Again, it's really difficult to do uh, dose comparisons because it's likely a partial agonist. So you can't really directly compare how it works to, to other full opioid agonists. And then there have been lots of cases of death associated with Kratom use. And typically it's not Kratom alone. And oftentimes it's because people think they're taking Kratom and then they, instead of just Kratom, they're getting something else. So there was an outbreak in Sweden of nine deaths that had O-desmethyltramadol, which is the one of the active metabolites of tramadol. Um, and that was what the death was attributed to. There's been an MMWR released. And again, most of the patients that died with Kratom in their system had lots of other stuff. So it's not typically just Kratom. It's Kratom plus, whether it's op other opioids or other sedating medications. So by itself, it's likely relatively safe. But once you start combining it with other sedatives, then you're putting yourself at risk of death, if that's what you're getting. Because again, it's not FDA approved. So you have no idea what you're getting, right? You buy an herbal supplement and they could be putting anything they want into it because there's no requirement for testing. And so Kratom withdrawal has been found in patients that typically use over three doses a day. Um, these patients often have cravings 
associated with it and then withdraw if they stop taking it, which makes sense, right? When you think about the dosing interval of a drug, if you're miss, you know, if you're requiring it three or four times a day, then you're likely to feel it when when you don't have it if the half life isn't very long. So right, so methadone you can take once a day. Something like oxycodone you're going to withdraw from if you miss, you know, two or three dosing intervals, so you know, eight or twelve hours. And so kratom seems pr relatively close to oxycodone. And so opioid withdrawal, classic. You get the classic signs and symptoms. I'm not going to go over those. And there are lots of reports of buprenorphine being used to treat kratom use disorder. And we have used it at the University of Michigan a few handful of times with, with very good success. You know, we, I have definitely had patients that either because of cost or how it's affecting their life want to get off kratom and they just can't because of the withdrawal and the urges and cravings. And for those patients, buprenorphine is a treatment option. So next case, 19-year-old uh, female with seizures. She's agitated, requiring restraints. Her vital signs, she's mildly hypertensive, mildly tachycardic. She has altered mental status with kind of intermittent somnolence and keeps repeating, is this real? Her urine drug screen is unremarkable. Case four is a 20-year-old male with altered mental status. His vital signs are relatively unremarkable, maybe a mild tachycardia. He's unable to speak. He's catatonic. He's lying with his eyes open. He's unresponsive to painful stimuli. He has intermittent periods of zombie-like groaning and slow mechanical movements of his arms and legs. And this isn't a zombie outbreak, just as a heads up. And his urine drug screen demonstrated THC. And so this is where we're going to start talking about the synthetic cannabinoids. And under, to, or understand the synthetic cannabinoids, you kind of have to have a good idea of what a cannabinoid is. Right. And so cannabis is a plant. Uh, the two main ones used for recreational purposes are the cannabis sativa and indica. There's three. It, so like all plants, you know, people talk about wanting to use a substance because it's all natural. Well, when you when you take a plant product, typically there's lots and lots of active compounds in varying ratios. So as opposed to purchasing synthetic THC, where you know exactly what you're getting, and it's the same every time. When you use cannabis, you just, you know, it's a plant. So you're not actually sure what you're getting and you're getting a lot of different substances uh, with the three major cannabinoids being cannabidiol, cannabidiol, and uh, tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. So it's been used for thousands of years. Uh, first isolated, the THC was first isolated in 1964. Um, it took until the 80s for them to find the receptor that can that THC binds to, and ultimately they did find a cannabinoid receptor with a, an endogenous cannabinoid, uh, anandamide being one of the probably the most famous ones. And uh, initially, back in the day, they didn't think it was even a receptor activated molecule. The CB1 receptor is in mostly in the CNS. Uh, it modulates memory, cognition, nausea, vomiting, vasodilation, arterial tone. CB2 is, is found more peripherally in immune cells, thymus, spleen, tonsils, and, that, and it modulates the immune responses and inflammation. And so spice is kind of the classic early on synthetic cannabinoid. And it's not this type of spice. It's this type of spice, right? And so if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, Again, our K2 blends are 100% legal. Um, and it's typically, and if you look at the, the product on the left, it looks like some plant product, right? That, that people who use THC are used to seeing. And it says, again, strongest K2 incense ever made, because again, they can't market it for human use, but it's an incense. So it's you know, not regulated by the FDA. And so synthetic cannabinoids, you know, they thought this was the, the medication that was going to treat all these different things, you know, seizures, pain, inflammation, anxiety, depression. And so they were investigated in the 60s. But again, you know, you make a, a, a drug and you're going to have a ton of psychoactive effects because of the, the receptors, right? If it binds a receptor, it binds a receptor. And it's hard to to make it only do the only have the effects you want. And so there's a ton of different synthetic cannabinoids that have been developed, right? And I'm not going to go over each different kind, but there's a lot. Um, 
and then which ones do we actually see and again so this is this is the the thing right if the jwh molecules are made illegal you know they come out in 2010 and then they're made illegal in 2012 then another one comes out and then when that's made that's made illegal then you get another one and because of these these synthetic cannabinoids have such different structures you don't even need to substitute it you just take one of the different structures that hasn't been made illegal yet and again this just demonstrates that there's lots of different ones that come out and which one is the most popular is is going to be you know hard to determine and it's going to change every year and so these kind of became popular around 2010 and so what they did was they took plant material and then coated it with these synthetic cannabinoids, right? So the, the cannabis is a plant product. So when you buy cannabis, you're buying a plant. When you're buying synthetic cannabinoids, you're buying a drug. But this drug is put onto something typically, right? So you're not usually buying the powder. You're buying something that looks like a plant-like material. And again, it was often used by adolescents and young adults because, you know, it, you know, especially back then, cannabis was illegal most places. And even if it wasn't illegal, you still can't buy as a 16-year-old, but you can go to a gas station and buy this stuff. And the names, again, Spice is the classic. Spice and K2 are kind of the most famous ones, but it has been marketed under so many different names. I, I mean, this is just a few of the ones I found. And so it, there's not much known about the human pharmacology because these have never been tested for human use. But what we do know is that the THC is a partial agonist, but the synthetic cannabinoids are full agonists. So they're hundreds of times more potent than THC. And that's why these patients have such bad adverse effects, right? It's pretty rare to have a patient come to the emergency department because they smoked THC. Now they might have a bad trip and get super paranoid or something along those lines, but that's pretty much the only reason. They're not typically coming in for a medical reason, like they, they had a seizure or an MI. Um, but the synthetics are totally different ball game. And so what herbs are used, and again, there's just a bunch of different stuff people have put, have found in these products. And so what do they look like clinically? So typically the hypertensive, they're tachycardic. Um, they typically have feelings of impending doom. So that that's oftentimes the patients I saw back in around 2011, 2012, where patients took the substance and they felt like they were going to die. So they came into the ER and then, and then typically you gave them a dose of benzos and they'd be fine in, in a few hours and be able to go home. Just like cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, you get a lot of this intractable nausea and vomiting, but there's also been seizures, acute kidney injury, and myocardial infarction. And again, these are young patients. These are in like 20-year-olds, 19-year-olds. This isn't older patients having bad complications. This is young people with bad, bad things. And so the deaths that have been associated with these medications are either from the drug itself, you know, the MIs, the seizures, or from a behaviors associated with it, right? Patients have jumped out of windows. Patients have killed themselves because they were they're so anxious. And so those are the kind of the two main causes of death that's been associated with these medications. And so how do you treat these? It's it's basically any, just like any stimulant type of medication. You want a quiet, dimly lit environment to minimize stimulation. Benzodiazepines if needed to treat them medically. If they have intractable vomiting, you give them vomiting medicine, IV fluids. And then typically they resolve within hours, assuming they don't have the MI. And there has been a withdrawal associated with these medications. And again, it's typically patients that are using a lot for over a long period of time. And then the symptoms can last up to a week, relieved by restarting a drug, right? That's pretty good evidence that this these withdrawal syndromes are associated with these, these substances. But most of the cases don't have confirmation, laboratory confirmation of these of these drugs because most labs cannot test for these. And so the withdrawal syndrome that's been described is, you know, agitation, palpitations, tachycardia, insomnia, headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and, and um, anhedonia or, or depression. And the majority of these synthetic cannabinoids cannot be detected on urine drug screens. So again, the, to make this diagnosis, you need um, a history and ideally they'll, they'll be able to tell you what substance they've been taking. So you can either look it up online 
or um, call your local poison center and, and hopefully they'll have some information about it. And so case three, the young woman who seized, she was found to have two different of the JWH compounds but that was done by the NMS laboratory, right? So there's only a couple labs in the whole country that typically run these type of things. And the NMS labs is one of them. And then case four was actually a published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, there was an outbreak in Brooklyn of patients that that um, patients were acting zombie like, as described by bystanders, and they were all found to use this AK forty seven. This is again, this is just a compound. And again, if you look at the caution, it says use as directed only. Do not intentionally inhale, ingest, or burn for any reason. Right? They're saying this is this is an aroma therapy product intended to create aroma daily and is not intended for consumption. It says right on the package. Right? This is just a potpourri. So if you ignore those instructions at your own risk, and they're not regulated by the FDA because again, it's not for human consumption. And so they did a the um the health department did a big um, investigation into it. And it was found to be Fubinaca, which again is one of these synthetic cannabinoids. Um, case five. And so, and so that makes, that's the other thing that makes it challenging, right? You get these two totally different clinical presentations from the same class of drug. So how do you know what they took if you didn't have any information, right? You, you have no idea, like zombie-like, like what, what drugs do that? Um, the seizures, you know, you can do lots of different medications cause that. Um, and so, you know, your differential is so wide on, on medications that can cause seizures. So this, again, demonstrates the challenges of these substances. Case five is a 40-year-old male found agitated naked in the street. The patient been insufflating and injecting a substance. He's aggressive and controllable, delusional, so the police were called. He was tased three times to gain control and transported by EMS. Upon arrival, he was hypertensive, tachycardiac, and tachycipnic. And I saw, I can't even tell you how many cases of this I saw. It was it was quite a bit in, in a short period of time. And again, they're almost always found naked, and they almost always got tased multiple times. This is his um, rhythm strip done by EMS. And then... Quickly after arrival to the ER, he became very quiet and withdrawn. And when a patient who has been using sympathomimetics becomes quiet and withdrawn, or police are holding them down and they stop fighting, that is a sign that they may be going into cardiac arrest, right? So it's not, it's not like the drugs they've taken have worn off. So why did they quit becoming agitated? So either you did something, you gave them a bunch of, of sedating medications, or they just died, right? Those are the two most common explanations. So this patient developed a bradycardic arrest, uh, got intubated, received vasopressors. He had return of spontaneous circulation after 30 minutes of CPR and his core temperatures was 105.4 degrees. Case six is a 15 year old female with ultra mental status, nausea, vomiting, uttering inappropriate words when responding to others. Her vital signs are relatively unremarkable for a 15 year old. Head CT was unremarkable, but her sodium was 118 millimoles per liter, which is significantly lower than you would expect at, at the low normal being 135. Her hyponatremia was managed with fluid restrictions. Her electrolytes returned with the normal in 24 hours, but she had mild dysphagia and anterior grade amnesia. And her MRI three days after admission showed multifocal subcortical signal abnormalities. And so this is kind of the next class we're going to be talking about is the stimulants. In this case, the phenylethyl, one, a, a subtype of the phenylethylamines. And so, again, we talked about these. These are sympathomedics plus minus hallucinogenic plus or minus and pathogens. And again, these, these were... Drugs were available in small packets that had milligrams to gram containers, and oftentimes were sold under bath salts, and that's where this name came from. But it wasn't those bath salts, it was these bath salts. And what was the chemical in these bath salts? And again, there's a ton of different chemicals that, that fit, fit the, this profile. The classic one was the ivory wave 
I think that was one of the earliest bath salt that became popular. And so these are synthetic cathinones. And they come, the, the natural version of this comes from the plant cots. And it has an active ingredient of cathinone. And the story is that the Russians in were in Africa and they liked the way this, this cot made them feel. And cot in Africa is used kind of like coca leaves in Peru or betel nut in Asia. It's just a mild stimulant. You know, you chew the leaves to give yourself a little bit of energy or buzz. And when the, the Russians tried to export it, apparently the cathinone became inactive. And it, it sounds like it, it was... Uh, it degraded from cathinone to cathinine and, and had a lot less of the effects. And so if you looked at the structure of cathinone at, at the top, you have the phenyl, ethyl, amine, and then you have this oxygen group, right? The classic amphetamine, the phenyl, ethyl, amine, right? If you add another methyl group, then you get methamphetamine, right, down here. Same thing with go from cathinone to methcathinone. And if you look at, uh, and then on your left is, is NM, MDMA or ecstasy, right? Um, methylene di dioxy, methamphetamine, right? Is the name, is the chemical name of ecstasy. And so if you look at this half, this looks like amphetamine. If you look at this half, it looks a lot like serotonin. And that's the thought of why MDA is a uh, empathogen plus the amphetamine, like that it, it can bind both to serotonergic receptors as well as the, the acts as a, as a amphetamine. Right. And then these are just some other of the, of the synthetic cathinones that came out and they all have slightly different properties. And so, again, there's no published studies on how bath salts work in humans. So we basically bit, place just like anything in toxicology. If you have a substance that you have no data on, you, what you do is you look at other substances that are very similar. And so when you talk about bath salts, you're talking about amphetamine like substances. And so the way amphetamines work is they increase, they inhibit the uptake of amphetamines, they increase the release of biogenic amines, and they decrease the metabolism. And again, the biogenic amines are dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. And so, again, when you're talking about the novel psychoactive substances, each year you're going to have a different profile of what is, is available and what is the most popular. And again, it doesn't really matter which one it is because they're all going to be slightly different and you're not going to have any data on, on what each one does. And so these are typically were used by insufflating or, or taken by mouth, um, onset of minutes, peak of 30 minutes, duration two to four hours for mephedrone. But when you get something like MDPV, you have onset in five to 30 minutes, but duration up to 48 hours. So when you overdose on MDPV, these patients would be intubated for almost a week. And you look at how strong they are, they're 50 times as strong at the dopamine transporter and times as strong at the norepinephrine transporter as compared to cocaine. So these medications are like super cocaine. You could, some patients that smoke them, you can use them per rectum, intramuscular IV, but those are a lot less common. And this is something I always like to, to share with people when you're talking about uh, the prescription medication, bupropion or Wellbutrin. It's a synthetic cathinone, right? Um, but it's used for medicinal purposes. And this explains why a lot of our patients will crush up their Wellbutrin and insufflate it because it is, again, it gives them a stimuli-like effect. And it also explains why in overdose, you know, when, when I'm called at 2 a.m. and someone tells me they overdose, I, I get a call about a Prozac overdose, of like, you know, benzodiazepines, serotonin syndrome for 24 hours, they'll be fine tomorrow. When they call me about a Wellbutrin overdose, I sit up and I and I come into the hospital to go see the patients because those patients might die because these medications are a lot more dangerous than the than the SSRIs. And again, why do patients take these? Right, because they make them feel good. Euphoria, increased energy, increased libido. They get hallucinogens. You get a lot of that pathogen um, effect, so they get this experiences of emotional communion, oneness, relatedness, emotional openness, right? It's one of the reasons they're talked about using uh, ecstasy for psychotherapy, but they're also significant stimulants. So if you take too much, you get all the bad stuff you get from, from stimulant toxicity, right? And I'm not going to go over each one of these, but this is just classic sympathomimetic toxidrome. 
And so how do you treat sympathomimetics, right? You do benzos, you do IV fluids. And the biggest predictor of mortality in these patients are is hyperthermia. So if a patient comes in with a temperature of 105, you need to intubate them, sedate them, and paralyze them um, until the medication wears off. Otherwise, you're putting them at significant risk of death. And again, depending on the half-life, the symptoms may last for days. So again, we've I had multiple patients intubated for up to a week, uh, depending on which one they were using. And so again, these these phenyl these um, synthetic cathinones share a very significant backbone, like the amphetamine. So it might trip the amphetamine screen on the on the urine drug screen, um, but if you do a GCMS, it's not likely to demonstrate them. Uh, so case five was a case of Flaca. It's just a second generation bath salt. Um, and case six was uh, mephedrone. And again, these are just different different synthetic cathinones. And so I just want to leave some time for questions if you guys have uh, any questions about these medications. I didn't, there was a bunch of others I wanted to go over, but I ran out of time and, and uh, um. I just want to cover what you're more most likely to see. Thank you so much, Dr. Menke. Um, yeah, if, we'll open it up for questions. Feel free to use the Q&A um, button at the bottom or unmute, raise your hand. Um, we're happy to um, we're happy to hear from you anyway, what you're seeing in your own community, questions you may have um, about what we've heard today. Um, we will be sending the slides um, out. Um, and so um, so for everyone that's been asking, um, we'll make sure you get those within the week. Um, and we're open, open to any questions. So, well, butrin overdose is so risky because it is a synthetic cathinone. And so rather than being an SSRI where patients just develop serotonin syndrome, where it, which is easily treated uh, with supportive care, patients that overdose on sympathomimetics like this can become critically ill very, very quickly. And um, Wellbutrin is likely causes cardiac to toxicity like a sodium channel blocker. So it has a second reason for, for killing patients. And so they get, again... You know, if you make it to a talk service, you're the majority of the time you're likely to survive. But well, butrin is definitely one where pe people can make it alive and still die despite best care. Thank you. We have um have a question. Are there drug levels that have been determined? No. Again, these there there's very little human studies in this. So even if you had if you checked a blood level on these medications, it wouldn't have any clinical utility because you you wouldn't know what it meant. Um, so the the again, the majority of these chemicals have not been studied in humans. So we're just guessing. And the guesses are just based on clinical experience. So if you have four patients you've seen, you know, an N of four is not a great way to make um conclusions about any substance and especially when we have difficulty testing for them so you don't even know half the time if what they took is mephedrone right you have to you have to send out lab that very few labs in the country do so what you know is they took a bath salt and you don't know which one and you just have to watch and wait and see how they they um they do clinically because you don't know what the half-life of the drug is are there long-term effects of kratom that are known? So kratom, again, is just an opioid. So it's going to, I suspect it has the exact same, again, this is this is based on my toxicology knowledge, right? So this this is an opioid. We know the long-term effects of opioids, right? The the hyperalgesia, the, the decreased bone density, the, you know, effects on the neuroendocrine system, all these things you would expect from any opioid, you would expect kratom to do it to, to lesser or more degree. I, I don't know, but that's what I would counsel patients if I, if I was going to counsel them regarding long-term kratom use. And then how, so how do you determine what substance is harmful within entering ER? Uh, um, um, can you repeat that one? It's in the, it's in the ch um, chat function. Oh, and, the, chat. Um, the, the question um, how do you determine what substance is harmful with entering ER? And feel free to um, unmute and, and share more. Um. 
so from a, again, from a toxicology perspective, what you see is what you get. So you just see what happens, right? You don't know, you don't know based on what they give you and you don't even know what's in the package, no matter what the package label says, because again, it's not FDA approved. So you just wait and see. And if they're having, you know, the classic wait time in the ER is for toxicological immediate release substances is six hours. So you would watch them for six hours. And if they have no significant toxicity, then they're likely to be safe to be discharged home. And then that some some folks have been prescribing bu bupropion off-label for the treatment of stimulant use disorder. Do you have concerns about this practice in light of the information shared today? So again, it's it it makes sense to do that, right? So you're just you're you're giving them an amphetamine like substance to, for treatment of an amphetamine use disorder. So I do in general have concern, like, again, this is from a pure toxicology, pure addiction medicine perspective. I do have concerns regarding Wilbutrin. I'm not a psychiatrist and I'm not giving any opinions on its efficacy for the treatment of depression, but I can just say, you know, if you put somebody on long-term amphetamines there, I think there are issues with that. But again, if the choice is between Wilbutrin and methamphetamine, like it, it obviously well, butrin is much safer than amphetamine than meth or cocaine, right? If if it actually works, you know, I don't. I would rather have them be on that from a harm reduction perspective. Good. And then coming from the Q and A, um, if someone is um, coming in with psychotic symptoms with no mental health history but significant drug drug users, including synthetics and meth, what would the recommend would the recommendations still be the benzo? So if they don't have acute, the, the benzos are for acute sympathomimetic toxicity. And so psychosis is not acute anti, acute sympathomimetic toxicity. So that needs to be treated more with an antipsychotic. And again, you know, from, if they're using meth, you know, they can have, you know, up to months of, of psychotic symptoms. So you don't know how long that's going to last either. That could be associated with purely acute intoxication, which again, if they were acutely intoxicated, you would use a benzo, maybe use the antipsychotic, maybe not, but you would wait for their cardiovascular symptoms, their signs and symptoms to resolve. And then you can make a decision regarding antipsychotic. Great. Thanks. Any any other last minute questions? I know we, we had some questions. Um, your bio, Emily, shot your bio there in for folks to understand a little bit more about you and your background and then um, the U of M providing education um, Emily um, was able to answer that in the chat, it looks like. Um, we One last question. Will eventually the gas station drug be tested to confirm toxication within the six hours? So you can test it, but you're going to be testing on what you have in your ear. And that's typically a, a, a drug panel that is antibody-based. You're going to get amphetamines, opiates. You're going to get benzos which is typically designed to detect Valium. The amphetamines is designed to detect amphetamine. Um, so a lot of these, you'll, you'll have testing, but the testing will be useless. So in the case of synthetic cannabinoids, the majority of the patients I have seen tested positive for THC, but it wasn't because of the synthetic cannabinoid. It was because they also use THC and they're just testing positive um, at the same time. So your toxicology testing is very unlikely to be helpful unless you work at a place like UM where they're able to do a GCMS within six hours, but that is very rare. The majority of the hospitals I've worked at have not had access to that technology. I had it at the University of Pittsburgh and I've had it here. Uh, I had it at the um, Regina and Commonwealth University, but every other hospital I've worked at does not have access to GCMS. And even if you do, those chemicals have to be in the library or they won't be reported by your GCMS. And that's that's why a lot of these have to be sent out to labs like NMS um, that have these libraries that are designed to detect these novel substances. But your typical um, send out lab won't do it. Your typical hospital lab will not test for these. So you'll have drug testing back, but it'll be inadequate testing that may give you false information if you believe it to be true. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Dr. Makey, I again want to thank you for your time. I want to thank all of you as participants today. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, you all are the reason um, that we host these webinars. Um, so we will be sending out again the, um, the presentation from today so everyone can have that to reference um, later and to share with your, your colleagues um, as well. 
Um, I have put the QR code back up on the screen for continuing education credits for today's presentation. Um, also information with eats.com if you prefer to register with them and go that route. Um, we are just super excited and thank you, um, everybody for coming. We'll, we'll be on for just a few more um, a few more minutes. We'll be wrapping up some admin tasks, but if there are other questions, um, feel free to shout them out. Um, just unmute. And again, thanks everyone for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Very informative.